All right. Uh, awesome. Uh, so let uh, it's eight a.m. here in Canada, and let's start it. So I'd like to uh, say good morning, everyone. If you are in the uh, continent, the west part of the planet, and good afternoon and good evenings if you are in the other part of the world. Um, so my name is Hui Deng. I'm a, an assistant professor in environmental chemistry at Trent University, and uh, uh, today I'd like to um, the, have the pleasure to facilitate this first introductory webinars in our wonderful series co coordinated by uh, Professor Luis Cruz de la Soda, uh, so our speaker uh, of today as well. Um, so on behalf of uh, Professor Douglas Evans, uh, director of the IIS, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Drude uh, for your um, work and effort in conceiving this webinar series. I'd like to thank you all to uh, for your interest and to joining this webinar series. Um, so Professor Evans, actually, he's right now in the airplanes uh, in South Africa to prepare you for the upcoming IAS activities. So uh, stay tuned for the upcoming events that uh, is being prepared for you. Um, um, so I'm not going to hold the stage any longer. I just want to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Luis Dur de la Soda. I'm going to turn the stage to him. Um, so our speaker is a full professor of the Federal University of Sierra in Brazil, and he's as well a senior researcher of the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development. He's a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, as well as the Future Earth Coast Academy. He, in his career, he has been engaging in various international collaborations and activities. He served particularly as a visiting researcher at the University of Hamburg in Germany between 1986 and 1991, and at the University de Toulon in France between 1998 and 2006. Uh, he coordinates several national and international network programs and projects on mangrove ecology, management, the biogeochemistry of the, of the continent ocean interface, his interests are mainly in the field of ecology with a strong emphasis on the biogeochemistry and environmental contamination, um, tropical ecosystems, so as you know, uh, and the impacts of global climate change on the ecosystem biogeochemistry. He has authored over his career 18 books and more than 300 papers on these topics. So um, thank you, Drew, again for conceiving this webinar, this wonderful webinar series, and uh, I will turn to you for uh, these introductory uh, lectures on uh, the mangrove uh, in the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you, Rui. <clears throat> well, it's very nice to be with you here today, this morning. Uh, I apologize for my voice. I've been teaching the whole day yesterday, so I lost a little bit of it. Uh, we conceived this seminar a year ago, discussing with uh, the AS, uh, because we see that mangroves are facing a huge challenge in this changing world of global warming, and many new aspects of mangrove ecology and, and conservation and management are being put forward because of these pressures. Uh, I am a member of the International Society for Mangrove Ecosystems. And I acknowledge many friends from Okinawa here today. I'm very happy about that. And uh, at ISMI, we've been worrying about the future, the fate of the world mangroves. There are many people that depend on it. There are many natural ecosystems and natural processes that depend on mangroves. Therefore, this seminar is, is quite timely. Uh, because the increasing pressure mangroves are suffering from many drivers. Uh, in this first lecture, I would just make a very general introduction on, on what are mangroves and why we are so worried about mangroves worldwide. And then in the next nine lectures, there will be specialists in the different topics that will go deeper in the knowledge of mangrove functioning and management. Uh, so I will share my screen to start the, this presentation. I hope everyone can see it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I hope good. so. Yeah. So, <clears throat> as I said, that uh, will be a very general introduction. Maybe many of you know much more than that on mangroves. But there are many students that uh, mostly from other countries and no tropical countries that may never be 
into a mangrove. So that's the general introduction for the next nine lectures that will dealt with do with specific problems. So as we said, I'm Professor Luis Luigi de la Serra. I work in Brazil, in uh, parts of the Brazilian coast, which belongs to the semi-arid region. So the mangroves here are, are very particular. And comparing to most other mangroves, maybe one of the regions that is not most affected by global changes. And uh, later, we will discuss some aspects of it. Well, so basically, oops, sorry. Uh, what is a mangrove? Uh, mangroves, let me minimize here. Yeah, Mangroves uh, uh, are mostly terrestrial plants, trees, shrubs, some ferns that grow in this uh, very small region worldwide between the continent and the sea. Although it's a very conspicuous vegetation throughout the tropics, nearly 120, more than 120 countries harbor mangroves. Although the estimated total area of mangroves are very small comparative to other forests, it's about 17 million hectares, which means less than 1% of all tropical forests in the world and less than 0.4% of all forested areas in the world. And then say, well, you know, so why so much fuss about mangroves, such a small thing? And, and it is, it occurs in a very narrow fringe between the continent and the sea and only in the tropics. However, mangroves are very, uh, I would say, exquisite environments an exquisite forest. The first thing, if you think about the planet as an oxidized entity, oxygen abounds everywhere. Mangroves develop in a, a noxic environment. So that's the first large difference between any other forest. And this has very important connections on the whole mangroves may play in the present global warming scenario. There's a lack of oxygen in the soil and the high productivity, <clears throat> which is chip cover, tropical forest. You can see in this small picture here that above ground biomass of mangroves are similar to any other tropical forest. But when you go below ground, then you see a difference. Mangroves can accumulate from five to 10 times more carbon in the soil because of one of the reasons, the anoxic conditions in the soil but others that we're going to discuss later. And this, in the present scenario of the global warming, is a huge capacity of uptaking, accumulate CO2 from the atmosphere. So mangroves may be a very important mitigation structure for protecting the planet from global warming. Apart from that, most of the population in the world lives close to the coast. And most of this coastal population lives in the tropics. Therefore, they use mangroves. <clears throat> and mangroves are a very important part of their lives. Mangroves produce many products and ecosystem service to these people. And a huge amount of population depends on the pristine conditions of this ecosystem, either <clears throat> as source of food, but also income. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> from, from where these mangroves came from, if you look at the planet about 60 million years ago, you already see that the coastal areas around the tropics were occupied by mangroves. You find fossil from Nipah fruticans, which is a palm chip of the Asia mangroves, Avicenia, which is a pantrophical species, same thing as Isophora, about 60 to 65 million years ago. And the planet by then looks like this picture. If you look today, most of the mangrove taxa uh, occurs in Southeast Asia. So there's two letters, A and B, a probable center of dispersion of these plants that acquire this habit. And this is a very important thing for these plants. They are restricted 
but no one else can thrive in their areas because they adapt to salinity, to dryness, to flooding, lack of fresh water. There are many constraints for freshwater plants to, or, or terrestrial plants, upland plants, to colonize this area. So mangroves very fastly go over the whole of the tropics, probably through the Tetchy Sea and by then to the Atlantic, and there was no isthmus in the Panama, so it could cross to the Pacific or around Africa, or, well, not so probably trans-Pacific roads from the islands to the Pacific coast of South America. But one thing is certain, the center of distribution were Southeast Asia. As a result of that, uh, today, <clears throat> the largest mangrove forest uh, is still in Southeast Asia. This is a present-day distribution of mangrove area uh, worldwide. And you see that the Indo-Pacific uh, harbors about 12.5 million hectares of mangroves, while uh, the Atlantic and the uh, East Pacific and the uh, West uh, Atlantic in Africa, about 7.3, half of it. The largest forests are in Indonesia because this huge amount of islands results in an incredible extensive coastline covered by mangroves all in the tropics. Australia, Brazil, and Nigeria in Africa. Those are the four countries that harbor nearly half of the world mangroves. Uh, there are about 70 plants that acquire this habit along the, the evolutionary times. Uh, so there's not many, and we can find 70 types of trees in just as one hectare of Amazonian forest, for instance. But it's not easy to live there. We're going to see the problems they face. Uh, and unfortunately, about 60% of these taxa are already in danger or threatened of extinction. You can imagine if a tree can go flooded in seawater, you can imagine that this wood well, it's very nice for building things that need to be left in the water, like piers, harbor, boats. And it's being used even today. Even here from my window in the lab, I can see people building fisheries boats using mangrove trees uh, for masters and, and other, uh, other construction works. Uh, <clears throat> most of these tax, about uh, 70 or 80% of it are still in Asia and Australia. But there is a very interesting thing. I mean, uh, like the Portuguese did 500 years ago, bringing plants from Africa to America and Asia and vice versa, that you can go in any forest here in Brazil, you can find Asian plants. Uh, it's happening again with mangroves. Recently, very recently, they found Soneracha, which is an endemic species of Asia, growing uh, the Atlantic coast of uh, southeastern Brazil. And it probably came, I mean, water ballast from ships or anything like that. And this is probably increasing this globalizing world. I mean, there's no, I can, uh, after working 40 years with mangroves, I see no reason why a Sonerache cannot or a Blue Yere can grow pretty well in the Caribbean or in South America. And they, they are probably going to buy following ships. So the important thing, there are some people that like to do this kind of thing. I personally don't like to do it, but there are many ecological economists that does it every time and try to provide a, a price, a tag price for mangroves. And uh, the most recent estimate is around $1.6 billion a year from ecosystem service only, not including the other indirect fisheries and other service, indirect service that they provide. So it's quite impressive how this relatively small forest may have such a huge importance. Uh, <clears throat> as most tropical forests, they are suffering from deforestation due to many drivers that we're going to summarize uh, a little bit later. Uh, globally, uh, about 40% of mangroves are presently threatened, meaning they are not protected. There are countries like Brazil, where mangroves are protected by law. Any mangrove is protected by law. You will not allow it to cut it, although we have already cut it quite a lot, but illegal. 
But in many countries, uh, there's no specific law to protect mangroves. Uh, the forestation rate is about, as you can see up there, much larger in Asia than in the Americas. Uh, this is easy to explain. Most of the mangroves in the Americas, half of it, are in North, North Brazil, and they are protected by law. So it's why the, the, the forestation rates are so uh, small. But on the other hand, 10% of the near threatened species are in the Americas. And this is a reason why you have some small number of species. So probably the two things are related. Globally, it is a very interesting thing because it, you can only have uh, the tail that or mangrove cover uh, in the satellite age. So we have 1980 as our reference to mangrove area. From 1980 to now, from 20 to 35 percent of mangrove area has been converted or deforested or whatever, destroyed in any way. We've rate uh, varying from uh, 0.5 to 0.22 percent per year and so on. But this uh, reference uh, area of 1980 is probably fallacy because mangroves is a, is a place in a very strategic place. All European arrived in Africa, South America, Asia. The first thing they saw was mangrove. Any of them. Mostly, uh, they have very good discussion in the, the mangrove community about the, the, the origin of the term mangrove and probably came from uh, an African term, mangrove, from, uh, to explain that. And the Portuguese, the first thing they saw was that in Africa. So it's probably this, what we call a reference mangrove area, is probably from 50 to 70% less than the original mangrove cover, if you think about 500 years ago, before the colonization of the tropics is started by the Europeans. And we have examples here in Brazil, for instance, uh, one large area in Southeast Brazil, which is in Guanabara Bay, which is the first uh, colonization point by the Portuguese. Uh, you have done good evidence from, from old maps of the Portuguese. They were very good in making coastal maps. They need that. Uh, that's about 50% of the mangrove area of the bay has been destroyed uh, from 15,000 to maybe the last century. So take care when you look about this, this area. Mangrove may be even much larger than it, it was in 1980. Uh, more recently, uh, uh, this is just another way of presenting it. The, as I said, in the, the Atlantic and the East Pacific, changing or deforestation rates is much lower than in, in Southeast Asia, the, the, in the West Pacific. The reason is probably the legal protection of the huge mangrove forest in Brazil. So you have this very low rate. And what is interesting is if you take, obviously, estimating mangrove area is quite tricky. Uh, and they differ by maybe 30%, depending on the offer. But if you take all these different estimates, uh, they vary from 17 million to, to 13 million hectares. But all of them show the decrease between the 90 and uh, 220. And all basically the same. So although you can discuss if mangroves have 17 million hectares or 13 million hectares, depending on the offer, all of them agree that the forestation is constant between the 90 and the 20 and around 10% all over the world. So that's a very important information, uh, mostly because you're going to see the importance of this vegetation for humanity to face climate change. Uh, 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 just a summary, probably other colleagues will discuss this more in detail, but as an introduction, I have to talk at, at least for some minutes on the different types of mangrove forests, basically four large mangrove types, uh, although all of them may be quite site-specific and differ from, from one area to the other, even in the same area, like... And, uh, you have riverine, basin, fringe, and overwash mangroves. I mean, the riverine uh, forests are those like uh, 
the Indus, Brahmaputra area, uh, the Ganges, so the Amazon region, mangroves uh, occurring along large rivers. They, are the, they have all the best conditions for development. They have plenty of fresh water. Remember, mangroves are terrestrial plants. They need fresh water. Yeah, If they don't have fresh water, they don't thrive very well, and sometimes they cannot even survive. So although they, they can support higher salinity, they depend on fresh water. So large rivers provide a lot of fresh water and nutrients and sediments. So mangrove has area, nutrition, and less pressure from salinity. So the largest forests occur along these uh, large rivers. Uh, in North Brazil, for instance, we have a Vicenia trees of over 40 meters and nearly two meters diameter. This you can find in Asia and Nigeria and other areas where you have these conditions of large freshwater supply, large sediment supply, and large nutrient supply. Basin forests are very characteristic from mangroves. Uh, this area, they are very important, maybe three hours from now, I'll come back to this forest to talk about uh, pollution mitigation. Uh, they normally are uh, very, uh, while the river green is dominated mostly by the fluvial flux because they are large rivers, the basin forest depends on tides. They normally are only inundated during uh, spring tides or during extreme flooded events. So uh, water residence time in this basin forest are very long. They develop very high anoxic conditions, which accumulates a lot of substances, and where organic matter uh, degrades much more slowly. So most of the organic matter produced by the vegetation is remained in the soil, while in riverine or fringe forest, which is an earth, similar to riverine forest, there is a larger export of organic matter. Fringe forests occur mostly along uh, low energy coasts and coastal lagoons, for instance. So they are very narrow uh, fringes uh, of mangroves, harboring these uh, mud beaches or uh, coastal lagoons. And they normally have low biomass because they, they, they can be very easily uh, killed by winds and waves and and things like that. So uh, extreme, not need even extreme events. Normally, if you go to this uh, coastline, you see a lot of trees uh, falling because of wind, because of waves. Biomass tends to be low because it's a very complicated area for mangrove development. But they are very important because they act as a barrier to extreme events from the sea. Erosion of coastline, tsunamis, and things like that. These are very important. And the overwash mangrove is a very specific type of mangroves. They are very common in the Caribbean, for instance. They occur in uh, carbonate islands, for instance. Most of the segments are carbonate, meaning that they have very low sedimentation rates. So sea level rise can easily erode those, uh, those islands. You're going to see that in most, uh, probably Professor uh, uh, Raymond Ward will talk a lot about this. I mean, sedimentation rates are completely different among these forests. And the overwash forests in a present uh, climate change scenario are probably the most threatened of all mangrove types. Uh, well, uh, the late uh, Professor Marco Vanucci, it has been with Ismi and one of the founders of ISMI, and uh, who I have the pleasure to work with and publish a book with, and unfortunately died uh, two years ago. You can have all the biography for ISMI or for the Brazilian National Council or the Brazilian Academy of Science. And she always said, uh, I think this phrase is very beautiful, that mangroves are a gift of the times. Yes, the mangrove depends on times, but also living between times is very hard work. And to live there means varying salinity, varying humidity, varying temperature. Everything varies and, and, and not a small variation. Salinity can vary from zero 
to 800 parts per thousand. Temperature can vary from 5 degrees in the southern limits of Monroe, the Americas, to over 40, 45 degrees. So it's not easy for a tree to live in this area. Most of the soil is flooded. So you're working against an hydraulic pressure. Salinity, we're working against an osmotic gradient. So it's quite crazy living there. So why these plants went there? I mean, because probably they are not well prepared as the terrestrial vegetation to colonize freshwater environments. So they're probably being pushed uh, to this uh, extreme habitat. And they can thrive there because they develop a lot of uh, uh, adaptations. And these adaptations are kind of convergence because many families develop there. So it's something to thrive in the, uh, in the between tides environment. Well, they have this muddy, anoxic soil. It becomes anoxic because the organic matter is producing large quantity and not degraded. Because since it's a muddy sediment, oxygen cannot go downward easily. So very uh, just below the surface of the soil, there's no more oxygen. So organic matter is only uh, degraded by an aerobic process, which is uh, very poorly effective to oxidize organic matter. So to live there, they have to develop first. They they have to be straight. So they have to have aerial roots, root press roots, something that keep them stunned in this moving environment. Anyone that has been a mangrove has the opportunity to dig the mud to the waste easily. Yeah. They have to develop ways to, to, to use oxygen, to respire. Pneumatophores, like this you see in Avicenia, for instance. Lanty cells, which are specific tissues that exchange air with the atmosphere, that occur in all genera of mangroves. So it's a very widespread adaptation. You converge to all these families. An adaptation to absorb oxygen directly from the atmosphere and pass it into the into the the roots. The salinity problem and how do you uptake water in such a, a strong osmotic gradient? This is also a quite challenge for mangroves. So they either develop salt extraction glands, meaning that it it can absorb all salt but express it on the leaves. And you can see in Avicenia leaves uh, 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 in the first picture, in the, the, the left side of the picture. Well, they are exposed to an enormous amount of UV radiation. They are in the tropics, so they can lose a lot of water easily. So they develop like, waxy leaves. Various mangrove families present thick leaves, full of boxes that reduces water losses and protect from UV radiation. There are some other constraints uh, deriving from these adaptations. For instance, when a mangrove tree has to put oxygen into the soil to live, because the, there's no oxygen into the soil, so the roots will die. So they pump oxygen outside of the roots. And this uh, creates a, an oxidizer mesosphere around the roots and precipitates, well, we are in the tropics, so precipitates mostly iron iron oxides and manganese oxides, as you can see in this uh, touch in the micros microscopy of uh, the surface area of a, of a fine root of his office. And obviously, this co-precipitates everything around. And this oxidizing mesosphere are very efficient also to protect the, the, the tree from typical toxins that uh, appears in an oxic environment, like sulfides, many organic oxidants and trace methods. So this is also an adaptation that is very important to mangroves to thrive in this area. Uh, well, the other thing is, can we imagine if you put a small little seed in a soil like that, you can do these experiments at home, putting any seed in a totally anoxic saline environment, it will never grow up. So there's another adaptation which is beautiful to mangroves, and this is why Professor Mata Vanucci always said that it's a gift from the tides. Uh, mangrove seeds, they, they have no dormancy. 
So they, they, they start developing wild in the tree. So you can see the small little babies of mangrove trees still holding on the trees. When they fall, they already have photosynthesis capacity because they already have a maybe stem totally photosynthetic. They already, they have already developed a root system or an embryo root system that allow them not only to fix, but to start absorbing nutrients. And most of all, since at least half of the time, they see the seedlings will drop on the water, not on the soil. They have a very large capacity to survive floating in the ocean. And this is why mangroves are fringes along nearly all the tropics in the world, because they simply float for over two, three, even six months floating in the ocean and still thriving. And it can still arrive in an island and grow. And that's the reason you have this beautiful green fringe all over the world along the tropics. And then there's a very important adaptation for changing genetic pool, colonizing new areas, and most of all, uh, recolonizing areas that has been destroyed by natural events or anthropogenic events. And this is another important thing. It's a kind of building uh, wave breakers for free and don't need maintenance. That is something we're going to see later along the seminar. Well, uh, unfortunately, as I said in the beginning, this uh, specific geographic distribution of mangroves faces a lot of problems. Most of mankind loves uh, the beaches, love the sea, like in Brazil. Nearly 80% of the population lives by the sea. Well, most of these areas in the tropics are occupied by mangroves. And mangroves and people, except for the traditional population that learn how to live with mangroves, uh, most of us uh, doesn't. Most of us see mangroves as muddy, smelly, full of insects, and we better have a five-star hotel than that. And this has been happening a lot. And neighbors in the Caribbean, the, the Maya Riviera in Mexico is an example, where mangroves are being converted to urban areas for tourism, for industrial and uh, ports. And this is, uh, reflects indirect drivers on the mangroves. I mean, all those activities, normally they have lots of different effluents from oil to nutrients to trace metals. Most of them actually convert mangrove forests like stream farming, forestries, harbor areas, tourism. Uh, most of the impacts generated are the contamination of large coastal areas, eutrophication because of excess nutrients, pollution by different chemicals, including oil, deforestation for converting to other uses, overfishing also. Uh, most like here in the Northeast Brazil, one of the major fisheries are crabs that needed to be regulated by law before extinguishing all the crab because uh, it's a very predatory when done commercially. The local people are very smart on doing that in a very sustainable way. But uh, also, and this is a very interesting thing, I mean, organizations like ISME, like many uh, uh, environmental groups, uh, perceive the importance of mangroves and start pressuring the society for a response. And some strong legislation has been passed in many countries, like in Brazil, for instance, coastal zone management starts including not only the mangrove as a conservation unit, but also as uh, an important site for people to uh, depend on. I mean, Professor Rebecca Borges will probably talk much better than me on this subject. Uh, strong regulation for controlling effluents in terms of pollution, nutrients, oils. And we're going to see some examples of that. Uh, this, unfortunately, is a very... Uh, in the top of this page, a typical view of a tropical metropolis. This is Rio de Janeiro, 
and Guanabara Bay. Guanabara Bay houses, as I said before, one of the largest mangroves in Southeast Brazil. But there is a population of about uh, 30 million people living in the bay, basically. So you have solid waste over mangroves. You can see the mangroves in the background. You have mangroves stunted by all kinds of pollution from solid waste, plastic, oil. And the result is easily, you can see, for instance, the formation in fisheries. And obviously, this is unacceptable. So many people start, many societies start changing this. And you can see in the, the three other pictures below, one thing, for instance, is start using mangroves in, in green architecture in cities. For instance, here in Fortaleza, we have a huge mangrove park where people go there uh, in the weekends uh, for trails and, and boating. I, I've seen a beautiful moment in Indonesia some years ago with Ismi. There was a couple taking pictures, prenuptial pictures. There was a bride and a groom in a mangrove uh, area taking pictures. Uh, in uh, Rodrigo de Freitas Lagoon, Rio de Janeiro, which probably every one of you has heard about, they decided to replant mangroves fringes along the lagoon, and they attract birds and animals and mammals and became a tourist attraction of the city. On the other hand, if Guyana, for instance, uh, we planted mangrove from protection from hurricanes, and Guyana is just the mouth of the Caribbean and received the uh, the tails of most of the hurricanes that cross the Caribbean. So they start planting mangroves to protect it from them. More recently, you have this uh, tsunami in 2004 that unfortunately killed so many people. But most of the areas that had mangroves, pristine mangrove forests, were protected. Here is stream farming, which is the major source of mangrove conversion throughout the world. In the Americas, in Asia, you can see uh, here in the graph the, the huge and accelerated increase in stream farming production uh, in the world. I mean, it's supposed to, to increase about 10 to 20 percent per year, and there's a major lot of area. Then you can see many pictures of mangroves trying to, to live with stream farm, which is a very different thing. And in Asia, for instance, in Sri Lanka, a mangrove Christian beautiful mangrove forest in 1973-2020 all converted to stream farms. We're going to talk a little bit more because it's not only a problem of deforestation, but it's probably one of the major sources of eutrophication through nutrient release and pollution through trace matter release all over the world. We're going back in maybe in three classes from now, three seminars from now, discussing this topic again. And there are other impacts which are not direct. They do not act upon the mangrove itself. It, now we, in reality, no one can control because they do not depend on local legislation. And the most important are climate change, fisheries, agriculture, and damming. Uh, damming of a river is inevitable if you don't have fresh water. I live in a semi-arid region in Brazil, and I'm the first one to say, no, we need damming, otherwise you don't have fresh water. But on the other hand, damming is a terrible impact in the coastline because it alters the sediment fluxes, the water and sediment balance, the nutrient fluxes. So in the coastline, for instance, if you go in the coastline here, where I live in Northeast Brazil, all the coastlines are eroded. Oh, mostly because it joined an increasing freshwater supply and continental segment supply with increasing sea level. So this results in extensive erosion throughout the coastline. And the, those fringe forests are the first to be affected. The responses are very difficult. Normally, they can they make very nice uh, uh, basing committees to manage the water, but meaning managing the water for people to use, for human uses, not for mangrove uses. So it tends not to work pretty well. well and there's uh, a major threat that is spread all over the world, mostly in semi-arid areas. Agriculture also is not done. Even close to the mangrove, because you know, there are salinity and things like that, 
But even if they do it very far from the mangroves, the modern agriculture is a huge source of chemical and nutrients. And this also causes contamination and eutrophication. If you go to Southeast Brazil, East Brazil, that receive uh, the effluent from our huge agriculture of, of soya beans and all commodities like that, you can see the impact in the coastal areas. Also, again, the response of the society is very poor because we're talking about food. So you talk about water, you talk about food, and this is very complicated uh, to control. You have to change the mind of the society to, to change these drivers. Fisheries. Fisheries normally, at least commercial fisheries, done uh, very far from mangroves. But now they are fishing for fish meal for aquaculture mostly. So they don't care what they are fishing because everything becomes fish meal. And then you can decrease the stock of fish links for, for providing uh, fisheries for the traditional mangrove fisheries, which is very important all over the world. And finally, climate change. And climate change affects mangroves mostly from the increasing frequency and uh, intensity of uh, natural events, mostly oceanic events, like the frequency of uh, hurricanes, the tidal bores, or in the continent side, decreasing or increasing, in our case here, decreasing a lot of uh, annual rainfall, therefore, uh, <clears throat> freshwater supply to mangroves. The response is basically a, a response only uh, given by the mangroves themselves, because we as a society are uh, proving to be absolutely incompetent in the abatement of climate change. That's a, that's a, a reality. We are discussing and passing laws and policies and many things for decades, and we're still increasing uh, CO2 and other gases in the atmosphere, we're still warming the planet. So, fortunately, mangroves uh, can do something about that, and we're going to see it uh, in the next slide. So here is agriculture. Basically, as I said, they are far from the mangroves, but the effluent ends up siltating estuaries, like you see, uh, not only nutrients, but also sediments. I mean, if you ever seen a, a soya bean plantation, when they are uh, taking out the soya bean, you see clouds of sediments you spread. These end up in rivers and end up in estuaries, increasing sedimentation rates sometimes higher than the capacity of the mangrove to grow up. Uh, <clears throat> river damming, as I said, is another problem. You see two areas here in a river that we worked for many years, just two years different, October 9 and 210. And you can see the amount of sediments that accumulate every year because the river is, uh, is blocked by the dam. You can see in the picture below here that till the, the, the building of the large dam, the river flux uh, varies according to the rainfall. You can see up to 2,000. Uh, all high fluxes are associated with high rainfall. But after the dam, no, there is a disclosure. The river flow do not follow the, the rainfall regime because it now follows the operational regime of the dam. And normally what they do is they regularize the flux and the regular fluxes is unable to export the sediments that accumulate in the estuary. So sedimentation rates increases a lot while wow. creating this uh, typical mud flats all over the estuaries and mangroves very quickly colonize that. This is already a response from the mangroves for this kind of driver. You can see the total area of islands and mangroves in this estuary increasing a lot because you are increasing the areas that mangroves can, can grow in the estuary. On the other hand, you can see the opposite. Uh, you can see down in the right uh, corner uh, the erosion of mangrove forests by the sea because you disrupt the equilibrium between uh, continental sediment uh, 
and the, the coastal currents. So you lose mangroves in the fringe forest and increase the mangrove in the rivers inside. And uh, when you put damming, agriculture, urbanization, plus those uncontrollable forces of global change, here again in the Northeast in Brazil, we see the decrease in rainfall uh, for the past 50 years. And it's, uh, well, some of you may say, well, uh, 5.3 millimeters per year. Well, in my region, there's uh, maybe 3,000 millimeters per year. So this means nothing. But here we have only 400. So we are losing about 1.5% per year of rainfall, meaning that uh, the Northeast Brazil is turning from the se from a semi-arid region into to a arid, desertic region. Uh, uh, the result is the uh, evolution trend of annual river flow to the coast in Northeast Brazil. In this area here, it was about 200 uh, cubic meters per year, which is not uh, very fast, uh, very much uh, for me, sorry, per second. And now it's uh, less than 20. And coping with that, you still have sea level rise, which is all over the world. And then here in Northeast Brazil, around 2.5 millimeters per year. So if you cope all those things, the result is erosion of the coastline. The, the, I told you before, the fringe forests are the most sensitive to climate change because they are just by the sea. So all these events will cause erosion. And this erosion is potentialized by the land use of the basin. They release a lot of carbon because carbon has been accumulated in these anoxic sediments. And then erosion oxidizes this organic matter, respires this organic matter, exports a lot of uh, CO2 to poor waters and then an alkalinity to the sea. So it's a positive feedback to climate change. So all mangroves are praised by being a negative feedback, meaning that they can accumulate a lot of carbon. But if you cut them or you let them die because of erosion, for instance, you just turn them into a positive feedback to CO2 in the atmosphere. So uh, you just avoid it. But again, uh, one of the major impacts of global change is exactly the capacity of, man of the mangrove that they develop to live in such a high, uh, rash environment since the, the place, to, since the 65 million years ago. They, they still do that. Whenever they are pressed, they, they follow a place that no, no other plants can thrive and they can live very well. So what you can see in Northeast Brazil, for instance, but in other areas, is a a general landward migration of mangroves. You can see this uh, first picture here with the blue areas that are new mangroves that uh, didn't exist 30 years ago in this area as a result of sea level rise and erosion in the coast. So you can see that the, 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 uh, the red spots are mangroves that are being destroyed by natural reasons. There's no human occupation in this area. And the blue is the land world migration, which is a response to this uh, global change drivers. If you go to the latitudinal limits of mangroves here in the United States, you can see from less than 20 years, a huge migration over kilometers uh, north, northwards forwards because changes in the extreme temperatures are going northwards also. And one thing that uh, impedes mangroves to grow into temporary climate is basically the winter. Yeah, they, they cannot thrive. They need a lot of energy to, to cope with salinity and all those constraints I talked about. And this can only be done in the tropics and under at least livable temperatures. Sorry for the Canadian. Uh, <clears throat> so they are moving forward and this is also occurring in the south but not everywhere because this migration can, both of them both landward migration and forward migration they may be constrained by other structure, other natural for instance if you go to southeast Brazil 
where the granitic outcrops of the mountains of the Serra do Mar are just by the sea. There is only a small area that mangrove can live. So if sea level rises, like it's occurring now, there's no way. I mean, mangrove will be eroded. There's no way to go. In coastal plains like in North and Northeast Brazil and many areas in Africa, they are probably will go inland because salinity will just taking away all the freshwater plants, leaving space for them. And again, in the Pole World migration, if you go, for instance, to the Peruvian coast, they're not moving south because there's a desert there. So there's no way to go up. Same thing in California. So there are natural constraints that uh, impair this migration. And also anthropogenic. Uh, if this occurs in a new area like Rio de Janeiro, no one will like to, to leave the mangroves to grow inland to where they play football in the, the World Camp, for instance. Although there was mangrove there uh, when the Portuguese arrived. So uh, this is a natural response of mangroves. So mangrove is, well, keeping pretty well with uh, climate change. And also, by doing this, they are protecting coastline. They are helping mitigating the emissions of CO2. And this is probably the major reason that mangroves are being protected everywhere. And there's the reason for this seminar. So uh, uh, just uh, ending this introduction lecture, uh, I will call your attention to these sites that you can find a lot of information on mangroves and in environmental sites in general. I'd like to thank uh, the International Institute of Environmental Studies uh, at the French University that provides this opportunity to raise public awareness on mangroves. And I hope in the next lectures, people will really be more interested in mangroves. Uh, the, there is a, a international pro program that I coordinate from Brazil that includes uh, French University, Cologne University, England, United States, Argentina, that deals exactly with this, this narrow fringe between the continent and the ocean. And you can also consult there. There are many books of mangroves on that. And ISME, which is the, the global house of mangroves. You can find in uh, ISME site books, uh, lectures, uh, educational material, videos, live, anything you can do there. So it's a very nice visit. So if you want to know about mangrove visits, it's my site, and you're going to be surprised with the amount of information that is available for free for everyone. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and Hui and Raquel for introduction, and I'll go back to, to Hui to go for the discussion, if there is any. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth, for the very comprehensive introductions about the mangrove. It is a lot of very helpful information, and I hope that frame as well the discussions and the, the knowledge for the upcoming lecture series. Um, so we may have a couple of minutes for questions, so I'll turn to the audience. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to unmute yourself, or you can type the questions in the chat box as well. Um, so there's any questions that come right from our audience? Okay, maybe to start, I may, I may start uh, with the questions for you, Drude. Um, mm -hmm. We all know that actually the mangrove is a very important ecosystem that capture uh, greenhouse gas, right? And then by the end, you mentioned that you might have actually the positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks uh, associated with the emissions uh, of CO2 back to the atmosphere if you destroy the mangrove. Um, there's as well the problem with methane emissions from the, the anoxic soil and sediment, right? And um, would you be able to comment a little bit about that, whether this carbon coming out of the sediments has been quantified as a carbon uh, being stored in the system or the value that we calculate is already a net emission value mm -hmm. kind of? Yeah, you see, in most mangroves, there is a net accumulation of a very large amount. Uh, from about 500 milligrams per square meter per year, which is much more than most of the forest. And once you keep the mangrove pristine and intact, the conditions for carbon preservation will be there, meaning anoxic, decreasing degradation, and 
a high sedimentation rate. So carbon is very rapidly buried in the sediment. If you cut the mangrove, then what you do is oxidizing these sediments, eroding the sediments, then all this uh, CO2 will be released. There, uh, most of the work has dealt with CO2, carbon itself. <laughs> but there are other gases that are very important. And then, yes, you do have a net flux of uh, nitrous oxides, for mm -hmm. instance, from mangroves. And also, maybe methane in the higher reaches of estuaries. But there are very few measurements of that. But anyhow, when you compare, even if you're considering uh, the standardizing these gases by the, the, the calorific uh, potential, which is about seven less for CO2, the amount of uh, CO2 is, is so large that even if this positive other gases, emissions, like I said, nitrous oxide is one of the major, but methane also may be, they, 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 they are peanuts when compared mm -hmm. to the amount of CO2 yeah. accumulated as, as refractory carbon. And, and uh, this is uh, interesting because uh, there are many works in areas that were mangroves a uh, million years ago, and nowadays are below the sea, for instance, like in Australia, or below uh, coral islands. And it can still even identify the mangrove species after so many million years because they are intact. The wood is still intact. The leaves are still intact, like a fossil. And uh, this means that uh, once stabilized, deposited, and buried in the mangrove, this organic matter is basically refractory. There are some, well, uh, obviously there is a, a oxidation of this organic matter through anaerobic bacteria. Uh, the anaerobic metabolism is still weak to degrade the mm -hmm. organic matter to CO2 and water. No way. But it, on the other hand, it produces a lot of dissolved organic carbon. Mm -hmm. And this dissolved organic carbon, although quantitatively is very small relative to amount of the refractory carbon is stopped in the mm -hmm. below ground, it has a lot of chemical, like you know much better than me, of complexing trace elements, increasing bioavailability of contaminants. And then in some mangrove areas, uh, and I'm going to see some examples uh, mm -hmm. from three classes from now, uh, you have an increasing contamination locally created. I mean, you start with natural concentration, but through this organic complexation, you increase the bioavailability, and then you have contamination of the biota. This is something we have been studying for quite a long time, and it's our cooperation will do mostly with that. And there's a specific thing on mangroves. In terms of global importance of that, it's probably very small, because we, the amount of carbon accumulates is so huge mm -hmm. that anything that can release it, uh, nothing, except if you destroy the mangroves. And then you're going to oxidize it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Drude. Um, we have as well two questions coming into the chat box. Um, we have actually a question from Clotine Michelet who asked about, would you be able to, when you refer to major types of mangrove forests, would you be able to re-explain quickly what you said about sedimentation patterns? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, you saw the, the picture of the roots. Uh, the first impact of this roots uh, system is a, a decreasing water fluxes. Yeah? So you increase sedimentation of particles. So fine particles that would normally flow to the sea once inside the mangrove will deposit. So sedimentation rates in mangroves are naturally very high. And since most of the basin use changes result in increasing sediment supply to the rivers, they end up in the mangroves and uh, deposit there. I mean, if you if you analyze suspended matter before entering the mangrove and after, you have a decrease of three to four orders of magnitude, meaning that mangrove literally 
clean the water from suspended material. Mm -hmm. So it results in very large sedimentation rate. Uh, mangrove can cope with high sedimentation rates to a certain point. One of the problems you may have when you have, for instance, uh, this commodity type mono agriculture, agriculture is the large supply of sediments that can overtake the growth rates of pneumatophores, for instance. And then uh, you saw the small lentil cells in the roots, the pneumatophores. They are not under the soil. They have to be in contact with the atmosphere to exchange gases. So if you have a large sedimentation rate, because, for instance, you dig a stream pond or you start planting soil on the reaches of the, the estuary, then you can overtake the, the, the growth rate of mangrove. Then they die. They are suffocated. They cannot exchange gases through the lentil cells any longer. It's what happens when you have an oil spill, for instance, the same thing. I mean, they, they don't die because the oil is toxic, but because the oil covers the lynching cells, mm -hmm. so they cannot exchange gases, and then they die. Uh, what else I can talk about sedimentation rates? The important thing is, uh, probably uh, Ray will talk about that uh, in some lectures in front, which is the difference between sea level rise and sediment aggression rate. This is crucial. You can you see here in, uh, for instance, in, in our area, many areas of fringe mangrove closer to the coast has a sedimentation accretion rate, which is much la uh, lower than the sea level rise, meaning that mangroves will be eroded. In other areas, uh, for instance, uh, mostly in the, in the north, in the humid climate, where you have a lot of sediments coming in, uh, normally the sedimentation rate is higher than the sea level rise. So mangrove can just migrate everywhere, I including the north of Brazil. It's migrating not only inland, but also on the sea because of increasing sedimentation rate. So sedimentation rate is a key thing. But I, uh, I don't think if I have answered the, the whole question, but we can talk more <laughs> about that. There is some sharing resource of real time mangrove over waste together. Yeah, I, 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 I see. I think there's a comment from Johan, uh, Johan Schiapani. Uh, I'll, I'll try to see, uh, at least in Brazil, we have a site of continuous monitoring. And through this site, you can follow some other sites that measure that measure. Uh, real-time mangrove change. I mean, they, they monitor every satellite passes, and this database is normally available. In Brazil, at least, the Brazilian database is available. Uh, so I, I will send you the, the, the site, and I'll ask you, uh, Alex, to, to remind me later. <laughs> and if you can yeah. send uh, your email or something, I can, I can post this. Uh, I think Alexi uh, said it yeah. might be some some link to uh, some Axi right now as well. Yeah. Oh, um, good. Alex, Alex is very good on, on quick answering. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Amazing. Uh, yes, I think we have a lot of interactions out there. Um, you have the contacts. I think the audience has a contact email of Drood. So if in the future you'd be able to see any questions about um specific point that has been raised during the this work lecture and then you might be able to follow up in upcoming lectures as well i think uh, drew gonna give as well as specific lectures on uh, contaminations or of uh, the mangrove system in one of the upcoming uh, lectures as well so um, uh, just one moment there is a uh, two other comments here in the chat mm -hmm. one is from Cultude uh, Michele, and she's talking about the polling thing mm -hmm. and uh, well uh, I'll, do, I'll make some propaganda send me your email i can send you uh, this book where the maps came from it's a book i wrote some 10 years ago but you have all this stuff so send me your email and you can get my email through, through Hakel or we and then uh, i'll have a pleasure to send uh, sedimentation rate yes varies according to mangrove type as i said i mean overwash there's nearly no sedimentation Carbonate mostly is based sedimentation rate is not sedimentation, it's carbonate precipitation, riverine and a lot of sedimentation 
in these areas. Basin, although the sedimentation rate is smaller than in uh, river in mangrove, they accumulate more sediment because once it deposits there, it doesn't go out. It depends on spring tide only. The river in, in large river fluxes, in seasonal fluxes, it can get rid of some of the sediments that it's deposited. Uh, well, that's it. Yeah, I, I think I, I got uh, all the comments. Yeah, 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 yeah. So thank you. We, sorry awesome. for extending a little bit too much. Absolutely not a problem. It has been very uh, great to see a lot of interactions. So uh, again, thank you, everyone. And I would call you uh, to join us again uh, next week. Good. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a great uh, day. My very best regard for my Izmi friends from Okinawa. <laughs> nice to hear from you again. Bye bye. And we'll okay. see you in two weeks or ten days. Yes, awesome. Look forward to that. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Thank you, Akel, for the help. Thank you, Alex, again for the help. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you, no problem. Bye bye. Thank bye. you to everyone.